First Kings, Old Testament book, toward the beginning. First Kings, chapter 18. The story that we're going to be drawing from takes up pretty much the entire chapter, uh, 18th chapter of First Kings. So what I'm going to do tonight, so as not to read the entire chapter, I'm just going to take a little snippet out of there, and then uh, I'll refer to the other verses as we go, okay? First Kings chapter 18, beginning at verse 21, if you would, and if you'd stand with me in honor tonight in, of the reading of God's Word. And the Word of the Lord reads, And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bowls, and let them choose one bowl for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other bowl and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Master, we thank you for your word above all else today. We thank you, God, for the scriptures which bring us hope and health and healing. Master, as the word of God is about to go forth, we once again ask that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon your messenger. Help me, God, to deliver the word that you've placed in my spirit for this moment in time. God, that it might bring forth fruit unto righteousness in the ears of the hearer. Lord, that it might accomplish that for which you would send it forth. Oh, God, today we need you so much, and God, I cannot do this on my own. And I ask God today that you would just uh, uh, minister to my spirit and help me at this hour, God, to be a benefit and a help to the people of God. For, Master, we ask all this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated. You are going to, in the next few months, you are going to hear a lot more prophetic references uh, like I spoke this morning in church. You see, think, folks think sometimes, man, well, that if you have a prophetic ministry that, you know, you go into a trance and your, hung, your tongue hangs out and touches the floor and, and then all of a sudden you speak in tongues for 12 minutes and then you give a prophecy, you know. Some folks have ideas about how God does these things. But when somebody has a prophetic ministry, it is not necessary all the time that they be prophesying in that sense. Sometimes the prophet or the person who has a prophetic ministry will incorporate what God has been speaking to them about concerning situations that are going on and concerning uh, events to come and what have you. And uh, they'll incorporate that like I do in my preaching. And I just incorporate, and I'll tell you, now the Lord has spoken to me. And when I tell you that, that is, thus saith the Lord. And what I mean by that is, watch your clock and keep your eyes open, because what I'm talking about is going to come to pass. Now tonight, this message has a very prophetic tone to it. Because God has spoken to me about some things that uh, I need to talk to the church about. And I'm going to just get in. Can I just get into the meat of this and quit messing around, all right? Folks, if you've been playing games and screwing around and thinking you're goofing off and God doesn't know this and you're still going to make it and everything's going to be all right, you better get on track and on the ball and on this thing fast because very soon all hell is about to break out in this country. You hearing me? The Spirit of the Lord has spoken to me and said, if you think 9-11 was bad, 9-11 is going to look like a car accident compared to what is coming. Because, listen, not because there are evil people over in other nations who hate us. That's a cop-out. The reason 
reason is because God is allowing this to come as a judgment on a nation that has refused to humble itself before Him and acknowledge Him as their only hope and their only protection. But all the while, Mother, they brag that we are a Christian nation, that we're built on Judeo-Christian ethic. We're the ones, bless God, who are lifting up the standard and doing the right thing. And Mr. Bush wants to tell us that he's the standard bearer. Mr. Bush, if you were the standard bearer, you'd help the people of America to know that our hope and our security do not lie in our troops. They lie in our Creator. Do you hear me now? And until this country repents and turns back to God and recognizes that He is our all sufficiency, He's going to allow the things that are happening to happen. Jesus. The Lord said, I mentioned it this morning. These Republicans are out there trying to... I registered Republican the day I registered to vote. I'm not going to tell you straight up. Okay, I, I registered Republican because back then, Ronald Reagan was president, and the man made me feel proud to be an American. When he got up on TV and talked, I felt so proud that I couldn't stand it. And when I was 18 years old, I said, I'm going to be in the party of Reagan. I'm going to be in the party of Ronald Reagan. But I'm going to tell you something, my friend. This attitude and this mindset that goes on within the Republican Party, and of course you know some of the most notables in the Republican Party are some of these religious right-wing fanatical lunatics like Pat Robertson. And then we've got that other lunatic who was a, a former newsman. Uh, uh, Lord, I hate it when I can't think of a name. But he ran for president a couple of times here, too, you know. Pat something. Buchanan. Then you got Pat Buchanan, who makes the average conservative look like a tutu wearing sissy. Because he takes conservatism to an even higher level. You know, he just takes it further than it's ever been before. And I, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, When are these people in this nation going to realize that their destiny is not in their own hands, it's in mine? When is this country going to humble itself in my presence and recognize that I'm the one who holds their lives in my hands? I'm the one who holds their future in my hands. I'm the one who holds their destiny in my hands. It doesn't have anything to do with the ballot box. It has to do with the prayer closet. We have been an arrogant nation. We have literally scoffed in the face of God. Because when events come our way, we act like God has nothing to do with them. And we act as though we did it. But we need to pay back those people for what they did to us. Let me tell you, what they did to us, my friend, was humble us. Amen. What they did to us, my friend, was help us to see that we weren't as strong and as self-sufficient and as all-powerful as we thought we were. That's what they did. And you know what? That's exactly why God allowed it to happen. Because he wanted us to recognize you ain't got it. You can't do it. I'm tired of all these preachers in this country running loose on television, on the radio, all over pulpits, all over the country, claiming to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, when in reality they are preaching a convoluted and polluted doctrine and a convoluted message, and the power of God is not present in their message to save, and the power of God is not present in their message to deliver, and the power of God is not present in their message to heal, but still they get up with audacity and act like they have something to say. 
Elijah faced just such a situation. This day as Elijah came up and faced the people of Israel and said, How long will you halt between two opinions? How long will you say one thing and do another? America, how long will you call yourself Christian? How long will you claim to serve the God of Israel and then act like God doesn't even exist? My Lord, children, we are headed for the tribulation times. And I want you to know that the Holy Ghost has spoken to me very firmly. And I'm not kidding, I'm not teasing, I'm not trying to scare you, I'm telling you up, straight up. There's going to be a lot of bloodshed next year on American soil. Watch and see. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. 9-11 was nothing. Nothing. Our leaders in this country still are arrogant and believe that they think they can stop the majority of the big calamities from coming our way. The people in this country are still foolish to believe that our leaders can do it. Are you hearing me? I'm going to tell you now's the time to be under God's protected hand. Now's the time to walk. Woo, glory. Mm. If you're going to get that hitch around you, honey, you better get it around you now. You better get it around you now. Because buildings are going to start to fall, and you're going to be in the shadow of that building when it comes down. Right. And if you don't get on board this boat, you're going to be under the building when it comes down. It is not a coincidence, the Lord has said, that one single soul who died in that building, uh, on, on the World Trade Center buildings on that day, it's not a coincidence that one single soul who was present that day died there. How many? Oh, my God. Mm. 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 He says, how many did I prevent from going? Many. I could have prevented all. But I didn't. There were family issues. There were, there were things that needed to be accomplished in families and amongst individuals and amongst marriages. There were things that needed, God needed to say some things to some people who weren't listening. And you know what? When 9-11 came and their loved one went down with a building that was 100 stories high, suddenly they got the message. I'm going to tell you, folks, you can't look at a husband for security. Your husband is not your security. The word of the Lord declares, my help comes from the Lord. Amen. Look under the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. Hallelujah. My Bible says, in the hour, in the day of calamity, I called upon the Lord, and he heard me. Hallelujah. I want you to know, children, we didn't need three days of prayer. After 9-11, we needed to become a nation of prayer. After 9-11, come on now. Why do you think I keep telling you? Before church, we need to be praying because all hell is about to break loose, and you need to make yourself ready. This is not a time in history when you want to be doped out on crack. This is not a time in history when you want to be snorting cocaine. You might could have pulled that junk off in the 80s and made out, made out okay. But honey, not today. Not now. Not at this hour. Not when Satan is soon to have his man assume the role of a supreme deity and potentate in Jerusalem. The Antichrist is in the wings. He's preparing himself. He's making himself ready. And we got people who want to screw around and mess around and play games with God. Got news for you. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. America has always taken a, a position in support of Israel. 
In everything that Israel does, we support them, good or bad, right or wrong. That's wrong. Amen. That's wrong. When good people do bad things, we as children of God and as a Christian people and as a Christian nation ought to condemn them. Come on now. You can't condemn Saddam Hussein for the things he's done and ignore the horrible things that Israel has done to the Palestinian people. You can't do that. It's not right. It's not fair. God's people are a righteous people, and righteous means right. We like things to be done right. We like to do things right. Hallelujah. And if it's not done right, then we are going to stand up for the right, and we're going to say, Israel, you are not acting right. But we have a bunch of pansies in Washington who are playing games that's politics. They want the vote. They want the vote of the Jewish community in America. Why? Well, because if I can get into that position, I have the power to control the situation. Honey, you haven't got the power to sneeze. You rather make yourself sneeze right now. Oh, you can't do it, eh? Jesus said in one place, he said, you haven't got the power to change one hair of your head white. You can't do it. Right now, man, will turn your whole head white. I want to see it. Right now, do it. He can't do it, can he? No. He hasn't got that power. But we've got arrogant leaders in this country who assume positions and think they have the power to do things which are reserved for God alone. I talked about it this morning. The Lord said to me, he said, I thought this was so sweet. The Lord said, I've been trying to show those fools that I'm in charge, not them. Why do you think Massachusetts passed a gay marriage rights act? Why do you think Hawaii has passed a gay marriage act? Why do you think New Hampshire has passed a gay marriage act? He said, I'll tell you why they have. Because these federal knuckleheads think they have all the power that they can control every situation in this country and make it go the way they want it to go. He said, but you know what? I've been making it go the way I want it to go in spite of them. And I'm in their face and I'm letting them know it's me who's in control and not you. And every human being has a right to dignity and equality and protection, glory to God. Because that's the right thing. That's, right. that's what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. He said, y'all think you're so smart, you Republicans think, as long as you're in the White House, boy, you can keep all that from happening. Well, guess what? Ain't going to happen. Because it's not you in charge. It's me in charge. GLBT community, listen to me tonight. Listen to me good. It doesn't matter if George Bush gets reelected or he doesn't get reelected because the issues which face our community, which call for right to be done, are going to be done because God is on our side and it's gone before us. Who in the world can be against us? So you need to quit worrying about whether Kerry or Bush gets into off the not either way. Doesn't matter either way. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. You know, there are too many people out here praying, Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And his will is being done. That's right. The Bible teaches that God set up Pharaoh at the time of Moses. He's the one who elevated that man to the position and place of Pharaoh. At that specific time in history, he wanted a hard-hearted. He wanted a thick-headed. He wanted a stubborn. He wanted an evil man to be in that position. Because that way, when Moses went in to demand the release of the people of Israel, the Pharaoh would resist, and God could then prove himself strong against the gods of Egypt. Hallelujah. And every one of those plagues, was a, a spit in the face of an Egyptian deity. From the Nile God 
as the Lord turned the Nile River into blood, all the way down to the frogs and the lice, all of those things represented Egyptian deities. And God was able to scoff the Egyptian deities one at a time, one at a time, one little plague after another, Cody, just scoffed those Egyptian deities. But he couldn't have done that if there had been a cooperative Pharaoh in place. So he needed the kind of Pharaoh that he had. Children, when are we going to recognize that God wants who's there, there? Whether they're for you or against you, whether they like you or they hate you, whether they want to cooperate with you or they want to block you, it doesn't matter. God has placed them there for a reason for that time. Leave them well enough alone because they're not the ones you should be trusting in to begin with. Jesus is. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, glory. I told you we're going to get into some prophetic messages coming up here now. Elijah faced his nation and said what God is speaking to the people of America today. And I'm going to break it down a little bit deeper and closer. He's especially saying this to the GLBT communities. How long are you going to halt between two opinions? How long are you going to teeter-totter between whether God is real and whether God is not real? Whether he is who he said he is or whether he is who, uh, not who he said he was or is. How long are you going to falter? How long are you going to sit here and teeter-totter on the edge of indecision? Honey, today is the accepted time. Now is the hour of salvation. i got news for you. You better get off the fence. Because fire is about to fall. Do you hear me now? Fire is about to fall. Elijah called the preachers of his day to the top of Mount Carmel. You know what? I don't have a problem with the politicians because politicians are ignorant and stupid and they think they're their God and that's the way politicians are supposed to think. But I have a problem with the preachers. I have a problem with the Pat Robertsons. I have a problem with the Jerry Falwells. I have a problem with the Rod Parsons, who can get up and preach groups of people in the hell, wholesale fashion, and not one time do they ever declare that our God has been offended by our lack of looking to him in the hour of calamity and trusting instead in our leaders and in our government. Come on now. Amen. You preachers, shut up. You ain't got nothing to say. Amen. And if you ain't got nothing to say, get out of the pulpit. Amen. Get tired of preachers get up preaching garbage. Have it nothing to say, Cody. They just regurgitate the same old vomit. One preacher passes it on to the next. Generation after generation, we hear it preached this way. So that's the way we preach it. I want you to know God isn't looking for a ministry that has regurgitated sermons in your mouth. God is looking for a ministry like Jeremiah where God can say, I have put my words in your mouth. Hallelujah. He wants a ministry where he can do the talking and the prophet does the speaking. Glory to God. Who we're in a time. We're facing the very, very last days. This thing's going to tie up pretty soon. God says, if ever, why do you think in the book of Acts, why do you think in Acts chapter 2, the word of God said in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Why do you think God said that? Because he wants his word coming out of people's mouth. He wants his word coming out of people's mouth. He wants his word coming out of people's mouth. And no more of this regurgitated, old-fashioned, un uh, no good foolishness that people have been preaching for decades. But you know what, Brother Willie? Without fail, 
you have a prophetic voice and you're in the minority. That's right. Amen. You're going to be in the minority. You better believe it. Our church may very well be the only church, I don't know, in the entire city of Dallas that's going to preach the message we preach. But that's all right. We're going to preach it anyway. Amen. Then it hurt me if we're the only one doing it. I know that I'm going to stand before God one day for every word I've ever preached. And brother, when I get there, I'm going to say, Lord, you said it, I delivered it. Right. Ain't nobody, Cody, you ain't going to be sliding into a devil's hell and screaming out my name, saying, Mara, you never told me. I'll say, Cody, I remember the 5th of September, 2004. I said it straight and plain. This is not a time to be teeter-tottering on the edge of indecision. I said it straight and plain. All hell was about to break loose. I warned you that Satan was on the rampage. We're in the last days. Tribulation is coming. And judgment must first begin at the house of God. <laughs> and if we're that Christian nation we claim to be, guess what? That means judgment starts here. That's right. Do you get me? Yes, if we're that godly Christian nation, we say we are. Uh-oh. <laughs> Trouble. Because that means that we're first on the list. When the vials of judgment begin to be poured out on the earth. You hear me now? And I want you to know, America, that God is truly, truly allowing judgment to begin in America. That's what's happening. That's what 9-11 was. That's what's happening. I preached this morning on the, the issue of people who call evil good and good evil. And it cracks me up how the leadership in our country points to those who did what they did on 9-11 and say they're evil. No. Uh-uh, they did more good for us. They started to do more good for us. But you know what? We can we get over it pretty quick. Oh, people rush to church for all of a week. Maybe a month. Am I right? Come on now. What about the, the, the gay community? The same thing. Apes came. Everybody ran to church. Cathedral of Hope built themselves a great big building. Everything's wonderful. But guess what? AIDS is more manageable today. HIV is more manageable with medication today. Guess what? Half the people who were going to church 10 years ago have quit going all over again. And I got news for you. They better, they better look up, straighten up, and fly right because, honey, I got news. You know that storm that hit Florida the other day? That's just the start. We're going to see more of them. There are more coming. And you know what? They're going to take paths that, the, that even the scientists are going to say, man, how in the world did it ever go that way? We thought it would never, because of the air currents and because of uh, this and because of that, we thought it would never go in that direction. And it'll wind up wiping out half of Louisiana or it'll wind up ha wiping out half of Michigan or some location that they say we, we just can't even believe it could do that. We never thought it would go there. But it's coming because God is going to get this so-called religious nation's attention Amen. one way or another. If not through the act of war and act of man, he'll get it through his own act. Right. But you know what the Lord says? But if you'll hear his voice and you'll heed his call, he will put a covering over you so that you will be protected from these things. And you need not fear and you need not worry. You can walk through the storm and while tractors and trucks and trailers are being blown by you like boxes of uh, napkins and tissue uh, boxes, the Lord said you'll continue on your way till you get where you're going. You can't have a better ally than Jesus. Amen. Elijah said, how long will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, serve him. And if they'll be God, serve him. You know, it's funny. You've heard me talk about the fact that the majority of issues in Scripture that are used against GLBT people, and as well as a lot of other things, uh, are really dealing with idolatry and idolatrous practices. 
Well, I want you to know idolatry, my friend, is still alive and well in America. It's still alive and well in our world today. And the sad part of it is many people have embraced the conduct of Mother Rome and they have begun to carve out their own images of God. And they're teaching people their own images and their own concepts of God. And I've got news for you. If you're not looking at Jesus, you're not seeing God. Mr. Falwell, you can paint the picture of a fierce, angry God all you want to. But I've got news for you, like Peter said, is that every in every nation, everyone who fears God and seeks to do right is accepted by Him. Amen. Amen. So you can paint your picture all you want to. Make him as ugly, make him as mean, make him as cruel as you want to. You know what? It doesn't change God. It changes the God you're serving. Amen. Amen. Right. Because if you're serving an image created by man, you are worshiping an idol. Amen. And I got news. There's a lot of Baptist churches, a lot of Presbyterian churches, a lot of Pentecostal churches, a lot of Catholic churches that are worshiping idols today. It's not about a statue in the building. It's about an image of God that is not right. real. That's right. You hear me now? I got news for you, my Catholic friend. My Jesus is not that suffering Savior upon the cross. He died, the Bible said, once and for all. But once that was done, honey, three days later, he came up flinging out of that tomb, glowing like a nightlight. Hallelujah. And I want you to know today that that's the Jesus you need to be portraying. That's the Jesus you need to be preaching. That's the Jesus people need to see. Not that bloody old beat thing on a cross. Amen. Amen. My God Almighty, you look at that image on the cross. What in the world can he do for me? Bless his heart. But when you realize he went from the cross to the resurrection, all of a sudden it becomes obvious, Mother, he can do something. <laughs> Whatever I need done, he can do it. Whatever I need, Cody, whatever deliverance I need, he's got it in his hand. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what I have need of. If he can go from the grave to resurrection, I want you to know by his own power, I want you to know he's got the power that I need for me today. Hallelujah. Glory to God. A lot of preachers out there today, they're in the majority. Man, well, they're preaching the doctrines of Baal. And they call it Christianity. But it's not Christianity. Because they're not, they're not preaching the Christ of the Bible. They're not preaching the Jesus who walked through Israel 2,000 years ago. The character they're preaching is somebody entirely different. And Elijah says, if the Lord be God, serve him. Amen. And if Baal be God, serve him. You know what? It's time to have a showdown with some of these mouthoffs who are preaching a false Christ and who are preaching a false message. It's time for the church to rise up and say, you know what? A scripture. You're not even preaching the true Jesus of the Bible. But honey, let's meet at Carmel and have us a little showdown. And if my God is God, let's serve him. And if your God is God, let's serve him. Amen. One thing I love about God, you don't have to do his business. He'll take care of his own. Amen. That's right. You never have to prove God. God will prove himself. Amen. Amen. You don't never have to Prove God to somebody. Right. You give them enough time, the Lord will prove himself to somebody. Right. When Elijah called the, the, the priests to Mount Carmel, he was calling them there not for Elijah to prove something. Come on now. That's right. That's right. But for God Amen. to prove something. That's right. You know what, Lord? <laughs> oh, hallelujah. You know why I want a Holy Ghost move in this church that will set this city on fire? You know why? Because I want God to prove something to these morons. 
I want him to prove something to these thick-headed, self-righteous, religious zealots and hypocrites. I want God to prove something to those that are preaching a false God and a false image of God. That's why I want a move of God. It's not so I can prove something. Brother, I ain't got nothing to prove. And if I did, I wouldn't have nothing to prove it with. My Lord have mercy. Y'all follow me, keeping your breath, because I'm 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 kinda, you know, losing my breath. This, go, go, go. They wind up on Mount Carmel, they have their little meeting. The other preachers, the other prophets who represent Baal are cutting themselves and bleeding all over the place and making a big noise and dancing around and doing everything in their power to incite their God to prove himself and to make himself real. Well, I got news for you, Jerry Falwell. You can cut your head off and pour the blood into a, uh, a great big bowl and honey, your God still ain't going to do nothing because he ain't real. But I'll tell you what, the devil will exact a harsh punishment from you if you're preaching, teaching, or serving a God that ain't real. You hear me now? Honey, if you're going to worship at the altar of the crack pipe, if you're going to worship at the altar of the Jack Daniels bottle, if you're going to worship at the altar of the marijuana plant, i got news for you. When it's all said and done, the devil is going to extract a very hard, harsh price from you. Because when your God ain't real, you got to go to all kind of lengths trying to get him to do something that he can't do. You hear me now? You'll wind up going to all kinds of lakes, brother, to try to get that drug or get that alcohol or get that senses to do something for you that only Jesus can do. And you, you may wind up dead in the process. God knows thousands have died that way. Because they just keep pushing the envelope. They just keep trying. They just keep trying to get their God, Mom, to give them what they need, to do for them what they need them to do. But he's not there to answer. The reason it doesn't do what you want it to do is because it can't. Come on, wake up, man. It can't. It doesn't have the ability. It doesn't have the power. If it did... Your problem would be fixed the first time you do it, and you'd never have to do it again, would you? Right. But no, we got to keep doing it over and 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 over again. Just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. Why? Because our God that we're serving ain't there. We're serving the false God. His name is Baal. He doesn't exist. But you've placed that image before you and begun to worship it. And God is calling right now today for a day of decision, for a time of decision. He said, it's time to go to Carmel. They get up on Carmel, and I'm trying to speed this up a little bit tonight. They get up on Carmel, and the, the people of Baal and the prophets of Baal built an altar unto Baal, and they put an offering upon that altar. And then they prayed, and they cut themselves, and they screamed, and they hollered, and they yelled, and they did all these things to try to get Baal's attention. And Elijah mocked them. He said, well, maybe he's gotten up and taken a walk. Maybe he's just not quite in ear's reach. <laughs> it's one thing I love about serving a real God. When I see people living their lives in foolishness and stupidity, I can look and say, well... Maybe you'll just never get what you're looking for over there, will you? I know I'm going to get it when I get up and pray. <laughs> I can see Elijah. I know God. Woo, glory. I know God's going to answer me when I pray. I know the Lord's going to answer me when I pray. These people make fools out of themselves all they want to. Get drunk and roll out in the street, you know, and make a big fool out of yourself and look like some kind of an idiot. And that's all right. Do it all you want to. Because, honey, when I pray, when I dip into the well of my salvation, when I dip into the joy that God has placed in me, I want you to know God hears me and all heaven is moved and the fire falls. Glory to God. The difference is the fire that falls in my life is called Pentecost. 
and the fire that will fall in the lives of those who fail to repent and turn at this time to God is going to be called Carmel. The Bible said our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Our God is a consuming fire. When God wanted to have a conversation with Moses, his first conversation with Moses, and he wanted to make sure that he had Moses' attention. And he wanted to make sure that Moses knew who it was he was talking to. The word of the Lord said that God appeared to Moses in the midst of a burning, fiery bush. A bush that burned but was not consumed. But wait a minute. Our God is a consuming fire. Why was that bush not consumed? Well, if that bush had been consumed, Moses would have never realized it was God. He would have just thought it was a fire. But that's why God used fire on Mount Carmel to prove the doctrines of Baal wrong and to prove the prophets of Baal wrong. That's why he used consuming fire at Carmel to prove those prophets wrong. But Brother Willie, that's also why he used fire at Pentecost to land on the people of God who were in the upper room because God said, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. Come on now. He said, hey, when I send my fire, it'll only burn you if I want it to burn you. If I don't want it to burn you, it'll simply purge you. And you'll be purer and cleaner and better than you came in. Hallelujah. Because, honey, I mean, that fire is going to do something. <laughs> it's going to burn something. You better know it's going to take care of something. But it's either going to purge you or it's going to devour you. And I want you to know today that fire is coming. The skies are about to open and fire is coming. In this nation and in our world, fire is coming. And children, you better be ready. You better be in a place so that flame can be a holy flame that lands upon your head and brings to you the precious gift and anointing of the Holy Ghost. You, that's what you want. Because if you're not in the right place, this is the wrong time to be in the wrong place. Because the flames are going to fall, and if it doesn't purge you, it's going to destroy you. Say, Brother Ma, that's the most scary message you've ever preached. As long as I've heard you preach, I'm sorry. That is what the Word of the Lord is saying. That's what God is speaking to me. That's what the Holy Ghost has said to me. 2005 is going to go down in history as a very scary year. Very scary year. It's been so quiet since 9-11. You know, we've gotten away... We've gotten away with everything. You know, everything seems to have calmed down. And again, what's happened is we've all turned back to our false security. And spiritually, Brother Willie, that's what a lot of us are doing every day. We turn back to false security. Well, maybe I don't have to worry about serving God. Maybe I don't have to be serious about serving God. Maybe I don't have to be serious about living for the Lord. And maybe do. Maybe today is the time. Maybe today is the day that you make the decision. Lord, when I lay down that bottle, it's laid down for good. I'm going to tell you, you put something in God's hands and try to get it back. It ain't going to happen. Lord, here's that crack pipe I told you about. Then see if you can tear that sucker out of his hand. Amen. Put it in God's hands. Children, we're, I feel, oh, oh, I feel such an anointing right now coming over me from heaven, I swear. I just feel a great anointing from heaven. We're in a very, we are facing a extremely difficult time. You don't know what's coming. Next year is going to be hellacious. And you need to get your act together. You need to get right. You need to make up your mind. You need to make your commitment, and you need to follow through on 